Beautiful, isn't it? That's the last thing I remember seeing when I left. هذه فرصة أبوها يا سيدي إنها تكتب وإنها تكفى يا سيدي أفرح نعرف الدواعي إيش إبو هايت أنت هاو ترتدع وحالة قحوطية أعرف أنه واضل في عنا What's your name dear? Where are you from? أنا من إفرح أحمد هل كان نبت قليها كويسة تاع if we're going to just do a little examination down below, nothing to worry about. Would you ask her how did it happen? See there. Tanwa Naga. Guess what talking can I think I think we all know a lot about, but a thing we don't talk about, about cutting. Mention why mention cut me. Wana tahan kena. Ahalat. Hey, bra, solo. I will not stop talking. I will not stop talking until we are free of FGM. Your best days are still ahead. And Ireland, if anyone ever says otherwise, just respond. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. وحنقولها هي كبدها في عن ما هو البطل. I will not be silent until girls like me are free of the fear, the pain, the shame. I will not stop. Whether black or white, we are all women. Women who are entitled to the same human rights, no matter where we come from. As you see, the trailer of the girl from Mogadishu. I'm a former refugee, um, newly Irish citizen. Not just newly, but um, I'm Irish citizen. I'm very proud always to say that I'm Irish. Even when I go back to Somalia, I was a person who lost it, her own identity. Because when I started the campaign in Somalia, I was told, go back to your country. So I didn't know where I was belong to. This afternoon session, it will be a bit different about this, the story we heard all morning and uh, till uh, before end. Now we're going to talk about a bit about human rights and rights of a person. So um, the MC, she said female genital mutilation is practiced 98% in Somalia. Um, really, Somalia do practice female genital mutilation 98%, but almost of, uh, 54 countries in Africa and some Asian countries do practice on female genital mutilation. But Somalia is a highly practiced because it's a cultural practice and it has nothing in Islam because sometimes we get this uh, impression about the people saying that it's a religion and it's nothing to do. Um, for example, in Somalia, it's cut the young girls because they say if they're not cut, they can go about uh, to have a sex and things like that. And also, it's a very cultural belief. Because my mom was cut, my grandmother was cut, and everyone was cut, I was cut. And um, if I didn't start the campaign, my daughter could be at risk on cutting. But um, I'm an activist. So FGM is something was happening in long generation. And truly, it come from Egypt, as it says, Fir'aun, which I really don't understand. The FGM, it come from Egypt, but Somalia is practicing highly than Egypt. Um, when I came to Ireland, as you see, the doctors was looking down. But the reason he was looking down is that when I first seek asylum in Ireland, I was told that I have to go for a medical check. I didn't really understand because English was not my first language. I just learned. So I have to agree. During the procedure, I had a male translator. As a woman, as a Muslim woman, as a very traditional woman, was very hard for me 
even to explain man next to me that I undergone female genital mutilation. So within the time I was examined, I was feeling myself trauma and I was feeling that why should I have to explain to guy myself? But I had to, I didn't know at that time I had the right to request a female translator. So now I do know that everyone have a right to request what they want. Then I went back to the asylum center where there were another 18 young refugees from different countries, including Somalia, Kenya, Egypt, uh, Guinea, and other countries, Ethiopia. So in the evening when I went back, I was confused by the Irish medical doctors, how they look at me, how they say to me, what happened, how it happened, um, how did you get the injured and all that. And me believing that this is a cultural practice and it was normal for me. So when I spoke to the girls, we all start crying and sharing our experience. And the reason is that the, we all had a different way of being cut. I remember one of the girls, she's from Guinea. She said that she was cut with a broken glass, like, you know, stones and things like that, and they put some traditional stuff. And Ireland is a small country, and all refugees were new at the time. So I say to them, we should speak to the Irish medical system and tell them this is our cultural practice. So at least we are treated with respect. But all the girls said that they were refugee and they didn't want to speak out. But um, I refused that. She said a few times, I want to be the voice, not the victim. So I decided that I will speak openly. Then I started within the Somali community. And I remember first time we had a gathering talking about FGM. Uh, the headline on the newspaper was culture crushed. So when young women with the community saying that um, I break the, you know, of the culture and the newspaper actually have mistranslated what I have said. So that brought me in trouble because the whole community get worried that I was going to bring them on shame. So um, I get a lot of uh, complaining about different people. Then I get scared. I stopped speaking. Then I moved far from the city, one hour from Dublin. I stayed there for like a few, few months, and then I sit back again, I say, why did I actually from beginning brought it to young girls together and I speak to them if I am going to end there? Then I say, I am not going to let anyone stop me. And I remember when I came to Ireland, I was told that you are now in safe country and you are protected by the Irish law. So I remember that word the lady said. Then I say, you know what, I'm moving back to Dublin and I will continue the fight. So I come back to Dublin, I continue the fight. Uh, instead of bringing to shame for anyone because of the belief of the community, if you, if you talk about such things about culture, it will bring us down to the community. We started to set up a beauty budget called Miss Ethnic Island. So it was inclusive with Irish women or European women, everyone was taking part, no matter what size you are. Even I was questioned by the human rights activists that how I mix the beauty and the, uh, the issue of female genital mutilation. But I believe that um, female genital mutilation is, is a human rights violation and every young woman have a right to live freely. So I say that we are the, the young women who have been cut should not be uh, excluded by the community and we should include. And that is the reason I say that you are beautiful no matter what and join the campaign. And this is when they joined the campaign, I became the voice in Ireland. So in Ireland, we, I, I campaigned within the youth. I set up called the United Youth of Ireland, young people from different countries. We campaigned with the Irish law. In 2012, Ireland have brought it the legislation way forward. So it was meant that no girls be, can be taken to Africa or elsewhere to circumcise or even the country. Uh, if I talk about a bit what female genital mutilation does to the body of the child, FGM is a removal criterion. It has a lot of different, it has type one and two and three. But for me is one thing because, you know, once you bring young girls in bed and you cut a criteria and you sew it back, there's no difference. So it has no health benefit except killing young girls. 
Like for example, during the cutting, young girl can die for bleeding. And during childbirth, young women can die for bleeding. During the marriage of the wedding night, young women can bleed as well. And Somalia also have a, the type one, a type three, which is the worst part of the, you know, cutting the whole thing and sewing back. So if there is no health benefit, why we allow that the community to practice? Then when Ireland brought the legislation, I felt that if I had a voice in Ireland, I could have the voice in Somalia. So I became a citizen. When I get my passport, I went back to Somalia and I started working in the community. But um, you know how the weather is, Europe and you know Africa is different. So when I came to Ireland, I adopted the new culture and new way of dressing and new, of, uh, new way of living. But taking that with me to Somalia was also danger for me because I felt that I was in between two countries. And when I went back, I was like, go back where you come from. And it took me quite some time to readopt my own culture because you know, you live in a, abroad and then you kind of adopted what's around you and then you go back to your own community, things are new again, you have to start it. So when I started working with the Somali women, first I started in IDB camps. When I went to IDB camps, I kind of know, know that a lot of young girls, they were bleeding to that. A lot of women who was giving birth, they were much at risk of death of uh, childbirth. So I started, for me to work in Somalia, I have to lobby with the Somali government. So I became an advisor to the federal government of Somalia. And then in that way, I continue my campaign in IDB camps. Through the camps, like I was surprised and shocked when the community say, this is, you know, I was like mother who give birth to a daughter would say that I was cut and I have to cut my own daughter. She have to feel the pain because when I was given birth, I have feel the pain when I get my period. So she have to feel all that pain that I'm going to cut. I was really shocked that the mother who have actually given birth to beautiful little daughter thinking of, I was scared and I have to do it same to her. So what I did is I just negotiated with the women group and religious leaders and everyone just to readopt me and also to be part of that society. Through that, we've been campaigning since 2014 in Somalia. Um, many of you, you may not know Somalia, some of you, you may know Somalia about the pirates and uh, about the war and all that. Because I went out, I landed, I think, on yesterday, yeah? yeah. I lost my bag, I didn't have any clothes to wear, so I have to go to the shops. Everything I'm wearing is brand new, I bought it because I had no clothes to wear. <laughs> So when I go with the tuk-tuk, you know, every country I go, I just like to adopt it where I am and meet with the people around me. So I said, I want to take a tuk-tuk. I went with tuk-tuk. And the guy asked me, where are you from? Then I said, uh, Somalia. And he said, oh, Somalia, they have pirates. Then I, <laughs> then I was like, well, you see, this is the thing. And this is why we are all here to educate ourselves and learn something. So I said, yeah, Somalia has been a war and now the war is actually disappearing, but it's still there is a war. So um, now you see girl from Mogadishu, and you wonder why girl from Mogadishu. Mogadishu is the capital city of Somalia, and I was born in Mogadishu, and that is why I chose to be called a girl from Mogadishu. So this is things that people know about Somalia, and then, you know, it, the war has affected in our community in many ways. Like, for example, Somalia, there is no law for female genital mutilation and there is no law for sexual violence too. In IDB camps, women are being raped and sub subjected to different violence. And for me, speaking out on publicly was not easy because even when you meet with the journalist the first time, he would say, oh, I'm not going to talk about women criterias or I'm not going to talk about rape. But that have changed over the time. Now people do talk about it. And I'm happy to say that a lot of young people, they see me as a role model because, you know, um, when I readopted again and I'm campaigning and I was born in Islam and I was raised in that, but female genital mutilation is a human rights violation and we have to talk about what rights for women. 
some of you, you might want to be a, become a lawyer or you might want to be working in the United Nations. You never know, or you might want to be a, become a leader on your own countries. So, you know, these are the right of, uh, one of the rights that, you know, is missing for young women, especially um, the diaspora world and in Somalia as well. So for me, when I see the mothers talking about cutting their own daughter, we tried to negotiate with the mothers and I had a plan in my head for six years, which is called uh, Dear Daughter. Dear Daughter is a, uh, I thought of the mothers who say that I was cut and I wanted to cut my daughter. So then I said, okay, maybe if mother makes a pledge to her own daughter that says, Dear Daughter, I was cut, I'm not going to cut you and I want to give you a future, I want to give you a better life, I want to give you education, I want you to have your own decision on your own body. I thought maybe this is something that the women will agree. So it was idea in six years, then COVID came. Who knew that COVID was coming and the country will be shut down and no people will meet for three years or four years almost. Then um, I meet with the UNFBA um, in Nairobi and then I say that, you know, I've been campaigning, but I was very disappointed about mother saying that I was cut, I have to do it because it happened to me, it, she have to feel the pain. So I meet with the guy who was the head of UNFBA in Somalia, and then I told him the idea that I wanted to work on on Dear Daughter. Then there was COVID. So last two years, in 2019, we were building the network of Dear Daughter to test it, because you know, when you're from a country where Islam is practiced 100% and the culture is very strong, you have to slowly see, will this work or not? And I don't want the people to see me that as I'm actually broken the culture and um, you know bringing them shame so we tested and then we felt that dear daughter will work in somalia and then we set up what website with united nation for unfpa the website was set up 2019 it's called deardaughter.org almost now we have 80,000 pledges in Somalia. So mothers, son, brothers, everyone did make a pledge. And then um, the website basically became last, um, this year in April, it became one of the third global best website because we had only one year campaign of Dear Daughter in Somalia and we became a third place for the global website, which I'm very happy. And I see that our campaign was going around. So um, on that, now we work with the religious leaders, we work with mothers, we work with the women's group, we work with the imam from the mosque, basically during the fr Friday prayer to speak about um, FGM. And you know why I'm standing in front of you and speaking about, I think the whole morning what you heard, the whole uh, inspirational stories about different, and now listening about human rights, I think it's a bit of mix of, you know, everyone, what they want to take in the future for lead. When I came to Ireland, I was just a refugee. I was nobody. Then there was a movie, I would say, like a lot of people would say, why is a movie about a refugee, women who come from war zone, who had no basic understand of anything, but now stand in front of you and speaking? Because I refuse to be put in down because I refuse to be told to be silent. I refuse to be told not to speak. I take the lead my own. And everyone should have that courage to say, yes, I can be what I want to be. It only takes courage to do it. And I know like, for example, in, in Middle East and African countries, it's very hard for women to speak out for many different reasons, but you know, if you want to lead something, it shouldn't be hard. And it has to be within you, believe in that cause. Like now I'm speaking about um, human rights and female genital mutilation. You might become an international lawyer and maybe someday you might be on the debate of this. You might be working in United Nations offices and someday it might be you work and fighting for it. And then you might remember, I remember Ifra Ahmed standing on the stage and speaking out. You don't even have to be working with any international organization or you don't have to even be a lawyer yet, but still you can be the voice. Nowadays, technology is the biggest platform for young people. 
one post you share on social media talking about the dad of the cause of female genital mutilation will help. Think about if you post something, how many people shares and how many people comments and how many people that they will know about what female genital mutilation is, what the problem is and how you can prevent to support. Because you know, always it's not about you have to be activist, but it's to help me to reach that point where I am going. Because now we want the FGM to le legislate in Somalia. Because imagine in, in Ireland, I was just a refugee and the bill was passed. And the bill is to outline on FGM mother to bring back the child or to do it within Ireland. So if I did that and I sit in the European Parliament and European Commission and I sit with them and I say that young girls who are born and who are raised in Europe have right to leave their rights. So what stops me to go back and say same thing in Somalia? A lot of things stops me. Culture, religious, man's kind, and a political, uh, political uh, crisis. So for example, in Somalia, we have sexual offense bill, which is, is being debated so many different times, but has not been passed yet. It's because of a political, because of religious, because of a lot of uh, dynamic and um, a lot of uh, political views of how they see. So I really don't want the FGM bill to be missed uh, and to be that way, but I mean Somalia, because United Nations resolution in 2030 is that uh, to end FGM. Now we are talking about four years almost went back because of COVID, you know, in Somalia or around the world, whatever development goal was happening has stopped in 2019 or early in 2020 because of coronavirus. And there was nothing happening. So even now people say the violence has increased. Of course, female genital mutilation have, have increased it as well. I don't fight only Somalia, but also we have a other network for other African activists, which we call Frontline to End FGM. We all come together, we share our experience, we talk about how the country level we can make a difference. So for me, I dedicate my life to end the FGM. I have a daughter. She, I call her COVID baby because she was born <laughs> right before covered so she is almost uh, three and a half i i remember when she was born and uh, first thing come to my head is that when i hold her still i was on uh, because i give birth on cesarean when she was on my chest i didn't just think about her i thought of every young girls and i taught every mothers who actually says that it happened to me it should happen I will never allow anything to happen my own daughters. And I will feel every mother should feel that way. But I don't know. We, we are pointing to reach that level on uh, mothers to actually protect their daughters. I stopped to cry. I, I refused my emotion to take me back. So instead, I really wanted to fight and end FGM in Somalia and beyond. And I'm really happy that I, I remember when I spoke with Kim as one of the speakers, in, he told me to come to Bangkok. I was like, what? I never been in this country and it's my first time. So I had the first time and mix, mix of, I was like, what should I do? Then I made the right choice to be in front of all of you because listening to other speakers and being here, I feel that I could, if I didn't come, I could feel shamed. But I come here and I feel that I contribute something and I can get something from you. And I know that all of you, when you go back to your own country, that there's something you're really going to try to work on, to say that that has empowered. I remember saying one thing, which is English was not my first language. I was speaking only Somalia, and I haven't been in formal school in Somalia. So I sit with United Nations in high level people, government, everyone. And I say, if I look beautiful and I dress well, even if I say something wrong, they will just look how I look. 
so so they wouldn't be busy about what I said, but they will say at least I looked good with my. <laughs> So that is why I said uh, yesterday when I landed, I said, no, at least I have to get something to wear so I can shine with the front of 1,000 people and talk. So um, I think I'm going to allow uh, questions. But before I go, female genital mutilation, it happened to me when I was eight years old. And the reason I refused is that it happened to me when I was 13 again. And speaking my personal ex experience in Ireland, I decided um, that uh, for me to educate other people, it will help to reach the goals we are looking for ending FGM. I will end up here, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. question but before that I would just like to express um, my heartfelt gratitude for your incredibly brave and thought-provoking sharing. Um, thank you for just trusting us with your story and allowing us to be a part of your journey. Um, so to my question, in your opinion how can communities effectively engage in conversations about female genital mutilation and do you have any advice for policymakers or activists seeking to address this issue given how this practice is deeply embedded in cultural roots? Yes, um, about the politician. You know, when it comes political in any countries, politician lies. All the time I was told, why don't you join in a political level so you can prevent and support the cause? I say if I join the politician, I become a dirty because the politician are dirty. When they actually campaign, they want to be elected, they tell all the liars. That liars, when they get their seats, they don't even remember you. So that is why I didn't join. And the other thing is that many countries with the cultural select member of parliament, they avoid to speak out on a such cause like female genital mutilation. And reason being is that if they've been elected in different regions and they speak out on female genital mutilation, they scare that next time they will lose on their seats. So they wouldn't actually bother. Even if they talk about it yesterday, tomorrow they wouldn't. So the politicians are very challenged, but um, as an activist, advice I have is never get tired and continue the campaign because you know if you believe within your heart as i say that when i start the campaign in ireland i was non-english speaker and today i am one of the person who can actually say whatever i wanted the african politician or african leaders when i go to the big uh, summits for africa for example i was in kigali last week for women deliver some of you know what women deliver is. So um, I was doing an interview with the, one of the big radio stations in Kigali, and they asked me, what do you advise for the African leaders? I say that we, they failed us, because if they listen to our voice, if they really want to make a difference, they will make with us. So don't give up and continue the campaign, and you know, till you make your point. And your point is that to end that horrible practice. There are many women who have experience who will speak loudly and openly, share that experience, and show the people this is the why I'm pretending to stop. Because, you know, when I went back to Somalia in 2014, people say, oh, you just become Irish. Why are you going back? You were a refugee. I said, if I can save one girl's life, even if I die, then I save a girl's life. Because Somalia, you might know Al Shabaab is a control of it, and you know, women like me are not accepted on the community. So, I felt that if I'm saving a life, I am going to save it. So, I continue with my journey to be in that. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much, Ifra, for that great answer to such an important question. Thank you for the question as well. There's that fire and that determination in you that just inspires me so much. All right, next question. Yes, right up here. Hi, Ifra. My name's Sean. Um, I do have two questions, but before that, I just wanted to say that 
Although I'm Australian, uh, I have Irish heritage, and I think I can speak on behalf of all Irish people to say that I'm very prideful to share that we're both Irish. So I'm a film student, and seeing that you've had a film dedicated to your life and purpose is extremely inspiring. So I guess I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how it is having your life turned into a movie and having your whole purpose encapsulated into a piece of art and also what input you had into the creation of that film. Thank you. And, and now I say I have a brother in the room. <laughs> um, let me give you a little bit how it happened, this movie being made. I was in, actually, I'm a high profile supporter for you in HCR. And uh, one of the lady who works with them invited me to go to Cannes Film Festival just to see how Cannes Film Festival is. And also, she said, maybe you might find someone who would be interested to make a documentary about your story or FGM. So I went to, to, to Cannes, and then there was a dinner with the one beautiful Irish woman who was at the dinner who made the movie. And during the dinner, she asked me three questions. She said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Dublin, Drum Condra. And that's where I lived. And she say, are you filmmaker? I say, no. And she say, are you director or are you cameraman? What are you? And then I say, I'm activist. And then she said, then again, she say, where are you from? I say, I'm Irish. And then I actually, we exchanged the passport. I actually give her my passport. And then she said, oh. Then we continue to have a conversation. And then she said, that she's not sure if she's going to do the movie, but she will try. And then. I basically sit in front of camera for like a few days talking about my journey, being a Somali, being a refugee, coming to Ireland, seek asylum, becoming the voice. And then uh, it, it, it was a challenge for her to make the movie, but you know, there was a movie. And th basically movie, the movie, it has uh, three different um, stories. And one of it is my grandmother because I was cut my grandmother was one of part of my life, and she was responsible for my circumcision. And my circumcision, I was not the only person. I was one of the nine girls. One of the girls, she have died for bleeding. So my grandmother made that choice. I had to go through an FGM. So when the movie came out, it was almost during the COVID. So, but and the movie was showing in a lot of different festivals and it received a lot of different awards and i remember first time was sitting and watching myself in a room all alone i get all the flashback my grandmother and then my father and then the rape and then all the you know problem that i have faced or even somali women are facing or the women in the war zone so the movie was tested around the world and then in 2019, it was showing in Africa. So it was showing ICB uh, World Population Conference in uh, Nairobi by UNFPA. And it was movie with all diff women, men, different countries, African communities, I would say. Because I was, I was scared that people, they might see something only Western, you know, world and, it might not fit into community. But um, I was sitting that day watching with everyone. And then when every, the movie end, I was scared that what question I will be asked. But believe it or not, a lot of women, they come and hug me and they say, you might tell your story, but you told the story about us. And the girl from Mogadishu is not about me, it's about the women who have been uh, subjected in different type of violence, rape or war or female genital mutilation. So that has given me positive hope that the movie, it can be showing in Africa. So then we showed in Mogadishu, which was even uh, much positive about. So um, from beginning myself, seen on the screen, it was like a stranger, but now I kind of see that it become an educational uh, material of the movie. And Australia, like for example, uh, 
link with the movie and the young girls who are brought it back to Somalia for forced marriage and female genital mutilation. There was a case a few weeks ago that actually I, I supported. And I never worked with the Australian uh, embassy in Africa. But to say that I am very proud that they were very helpful. The young girl who was going through FGM was brought it safely back to Australia. So yeah, I don't know if that's <laughs> But yeah, I'm happy that, you know, Australia, that I never walked, they have helped the young girl bring back to Australia, not to be cut or go through forced marriage. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ifra. <laughs> wow, you truly are the embodiment of a voice for the voiceless. When you were telling your story, when these women came up to you, so beautiful. Thank you. All right, any more questions? Yes, right here, the lady in here. Hi, my name is Nevi, and I'm studying women, gender, and sexuality studies. Um, I just wanted to say that you are truly a force to be reckoned with. Uh, I had two questions, uh, and I wanted to know your thoughts about this. Do you think that FGM is a product of patriarchal social cultural norms? And secondly, amidst all this generational trauma that is passed down from generation to generation, how do you think we can create spaces where we can promote sisterhood and solidarity amongst women? Thank you. Thank you. And if, like, if I talk about in 2010 and 20, you know, eight and. If, when you look at on gender equality, FGM is that little. Like all the organizations, no matter where, but FGM is little part on the work. And that really surprised me because, you know, FGM is not different to uh, HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS is killer, but now it has a, an, um, it has a, a medication. And also cancer is killer. And it's, FGM is similar because you cut a girl, she bleeds and she dies. And when you look at to international NGOs working to, um, you know, gender equality and FGM is very little to their work, is very stressful. But now when we look at in a global side, now FGM become a really, it stands its own. And I think to show solidarity, now we also have the Asian uh, and the FGM network that we are working on to end the FGM. So I think there is a different ways you can get involved and in, you know supporting on the all costs. That, for example, that Asian and FGM network, and then there is a European and FGM network, and we have also a social platform that you can support. And I think. Um, for me, like and a lot of uh, young students, they do find me on the internet and they email me for study research. And I always like, you know, somebody around the world emailing me and asking me if they could do interview for the assessment and all that. And I really do, like I, I give the interview because I want to make a difference. And those people, they also studying something to make a difference. So I think that is how you can show solidarity and work. And, and now FGM is different than 2010, where FGM was a zero. Um, it's on where now is everyone is talking about. For example, in 6 February in this year, um, United Nations High Commissioner and his um, press release was saying men as the men and boys had solution and that make an FGM to stand up as well. So it's good every year, six year, 6th of February, we celebrate on zero tolerance on FGM. I hope that answer your question. Thank you so much, Ifra. Amazing answer. Okay, yes, right here at the front. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when we say that your talk was very moving. Um, I think you touched on something really interesting. Um, being a woman of color myself, it can be really uh, difficult to look at how Western feminism translates into the Eastern or African experience, right? And oftentimes we uh, seek to criticize the Western construction of the Eastern woman as oppressed and inherently, you know, under the male thumb. 
So when we then criticize culture practices within that construct, it's difficult to separate a criticism of the West and the way that the West views the East, and then a criticism of our own, of our own culture. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned that your grandmother was the one who, um, uh, I don't want to say authorized, but perhaps performed um, the procedure or, or allowed it to happen, um, that really touches on that issue of wanting to be proud of where you come from, but then also wanting to critique aspects of it without lending to that Western stereotype. How do you kind of navigate um, being proud of where you come from, but also criticizing the aspects that you consider need reform and change? That's a really good question, because that is what always comes to the Somali community when we go to the, when I speak on publicly, they always say that, oh, you, you brainwashed by Western and you come with the Western ideology to us and you're telling us. But, um, you know, you can't please everyone, but uh, you can actually sit with them and basically make them to understand. So uh, what we do is that when, when they actually say that you brought it to Western culture to us, I give them one answer. In Ireland, I was given a life, I was given a passport, I was given a home, I was given a hope. In Somalia, what did I got? Nothing but afraid of being killed, I've been afraid of being raped, afraid of being taken everything I own from, uh, away from it. So I made it that choice when I get my Irish passport to go back to Somalia and make a change for the community. So it's very simple. I just tell them that I had a better life. And the truth is that I did have a better life. But I chose it to be in Mogadishu, where now, if I go out, people will call me and say, are you safe? Are you alive? There is a bomb attack. There is, you know, in myself, when I went to Ireland, that's when I realized that the war was real. Especially when I see Iraq and Afghanistan, the CNN, the bombing and attack and all that. That is when I really realized that there was a war. And then I, I know that what I have seen on TV, even I was born in that level, I have seen on TV, then I went back to that saying, I am going to be advocated on ending FGM. So it's very simple to me. It's like, you know, I chose it. So um, my grandmother, she made the choice. I remember in two, when I was going back to Somalia, I, I had a, a journalist, he was friend, and I think you can never be a friend with journalists. Unless you open your mouth, you open your mouth, otherwise, you know, you have to be safe. You have to zip it so you don't have to say anything. I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to Somalia, I'm going to ask my grandmother, why did she cut me? Next day, before even I flew to Somalia, the headline here was, activists going back to Somalia to question her mother, her grandmother, why she cut. He is my uncle who lives in the diaspora world, calling my grandmother and say, do you think she loves you and she come back to see you? Hell no. She come back to ask you, why did you cut her? I remember being on the plane, landing morning, going to try to hug my grandmother, say, stay away from me, don't hug me. I know why you're here. You come to ask me why I cut you. I know everything. I seen it. And then same time, I saw a lot of emails from UNHCR, like, um, refugee, for saying don't go to Somalia because already my going to Somalia was on public because I was told if I'm going, it has to be secret. And it never been secret because I opened to my, my mouth to journalists. So journalists are no friends. <laughs> So yeah, my grandmother was actually, I did have a conversation afterward and she opened up and she said that she was cut, her mother was cut, she cut my, my mom and she did cut me. And she said that she did because it's everybody was going to her and that is why she did. So, and then my, myself and my grandmother, our conversation didn't last because she passed away. And then one day I remember my father, who also passed away in uh, 2021, he held me on the radio that I was given an award. And the award was the Humanitarian Person of the Year. And then the whole country actually did congratulate me to receive the award because I was given in, in London. And 
even the president of Somalia at that time, he called me and he said congratulations and everybody was happy. My father listened on the radio. He called my sister and he said, why everyone is congratulating Ifra? What have she done to be congratulated? Because I could never sit with my father and say I was campaigner. My father, he was a, a religious teacher for 30 years, no, 50 years. So it's, it was very hard for me to break with him the, you know, what I stand for. So it was not easy, but you know, my grandmother, um, we didn't have that much time to talk. She passed away. But now I think there is many grandmothers who are in Somalia actually, who love me sometimes is saying that it's good that I'm saving the girls, but sometimes they can be very difficult to me. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much.